Okay, so back by popular demand, we're in the theory zone again. Um, this week's theory zone is all about bell hooks feminist theory. Um, the objectives here are to understand the key components of Hooks's feminist theory and obviously we're going to explore how these ideas can be applied to media products um, and of course you should be keeping half uh, half an eye, half your mind on how we could apply these to the set products that we've been looking at uh, throughout the course. So let's get started with a question uh, that's got uh, a lot of answers uh, based on your opinions, your knowledge, your experience and so on. This is the question. Feminism is often seen as a struggle against a patriarchal system in order to end a sexist oppression. Many would argue that the media has contributed to this end. Many would say that the media still reinforces it. How and where, in your opinions, does the media still reinforce an ideology of female oppression? So that's what we're looking for. I've given you a few texts there to just remind you of maybe our um, a dubious past in terms of uh, media representations of women. Um, but uh, I want you to think about modern media um, as well as traditional media or older media to think about how the ideology of female oppression still exists. A uh, few questions to get you thinking about this and to, to answer as well. Are some types of media more guilty than others at reinforcing um, a male dominance over women? Uh, how much of, the, of this uh, representation is based around the image and how much of it is rooted in ideology? So it's beyond just simple analysis. Are there elements of industry contexts that might be considered part of the problem? So in other words, is the ideology of female oppression more deep rooted than just the media product itself? Does it actually run into various media industries and the way they're organised? And these days we've got to have a look at the fact that we live in a changing culture we live in a very different time certainly to the text that you've got in front of you here are these representations of female oppression more likely to be challenged than perhaps they were previously if so how would we see that challenge take place in what context or what format would we see that challenge take place have a think consider your own experiences of the media and if you get a bit stuck do some research of your own Okay, so I'm sure you had plenty of answers uh, for that question. Uh, I think that you will have found some types of media more guilty than others. Some of you may have suggested that uh, perhaps advertising is particularly guilty of perhaps negative stereotyping. Uh, certainly, we've looked at music video as perhaps being more guilty of um, objectification and the sexualization of women. Uh, so you may have found there are different media products that do this in different ways. Um, you may have found that whilst we focus a lot on the image when it comes to um, analyzing and deconstructing representations, um, and again, much of that imagery may have been based around the sexualization of women. You could also have found that the stereotyping of women also goes as far as uh, routinely reducing women to certain gendered norms. Uh, and of course, the work of Judith Butler and um, her queer theory uh, certainly considers that idea that there is a socialization of gender norms and that could be reinforced by the media. Some of you may have uh, some knowledge in the contexts in of the industry uh, regarding media and you may have considered that many of the industries that we do study um, uh, as part of the course are ultimately male dominated and it's certainly an area we'll be moving into and looking at later on in the course. In terms of how these representations are likely to be challenged, well you would think so, or at least you would hope that sexism is challenged in society. We do live in more progressive times than we have done. Um, but n not only that, we also live in a time where there is um, a, an easier and greater right to reply with media. Social media now uh, means that uh, the audience has the ability to comment and respond and react to media instantly and noticeably. Uh, but of course, 
That also means that all viewpoints are expressed and uh, quite often lively, shall we say. Debates and arguments may be pursued. So anyway, these are the kind of things that we're going to be talking about in this session. I'm sure you have many of those already. Um, And uh, as we know from our kind of limited study of bell hooks so far in the course, uh, she is looking at uh, feminism uh, as a term which is about struggling against patriarchal systems. But before we move on, I suppose maybe we should consider that word itself in a little bit more detail because whilst we perhaps have for the sake of this argument an agreed sense of what feminism is it's another thing to look at what we mean by patriarchy and so for this we need to just remember that representation is not just a media term representation is about making sure that groups in society and individuals feel represented um by everything around them Um, and this is why we need to explore this term patriarchy because the term itself is definitely contentious and it's very divisive alongside the word feminism it's used in different ways by different people and that can lead to some issues so we'll have a look at what we might mean by this um, over the next couple of minutes The suggestion of male dominance, which is loosely what we think of when we think of patriarchy, doesn't just simply refer to numerical dominance. Uh, You know, as we know, the population of planet Earth is uh, 50-50. So there isn't a numerical dominance of men over women on the planet, um, or even just dominance in representation of certain areas, which we will look at. But this term also refers to the dominance in structural and systemic um, institutions um, it means that we have to understand this dominance with often with historical context and we can't just purely look at figures and numbers the consequence of this is a problem for feminists as well because whilst many Feminists have argued for and fought for equality over the years. A simple balancing of the scales rarely um, is rarely a long-term solution to addressing patriarchal dominance because a lot of the issues surrounding the patriarchy, as it's known, are structural and systemic rather than just numerical. So simply making sure there are an equal amount of women to men in certain circumstances doesn't necessarily solve the problems that are caused of course the other argument about patriarchy and whether it exists or whether it's uh, something worth considering is the issue that obviously men are often oppressed as well men often suffer at the same time well absolutely and we that cannot be ignored but the existence of a patriarchy uh, or the concept of a patriarchy does not necessarily negate the idea that men suffer are or are oppressed. In fact, for bell hooks, amongst others, the term itself suggests that there are certain groups, those with less power or influence in society, that would suffer at the hands of a patriarchal system. And of course, that can include men, particularly if those men are from uh, minority groups or groups with less influence or power in society. So there is a number of ways we could look at how the patriarchy or a patriarchal system can affect um, women just as much as we could look at it, how it affects uh, black and ethnic minority groups or um, homosexual groups or uh, other disadvantaged or um, marginalised groups in society, perhaps um, refugees um, and so on and so forth. Obviously, we're going to look at women for the majority of this, but as we move through Hooks's theory, we'll, we'll look at other groups too. So I was trying to think of different uh, systems in um, society where we would expect representation or the importance of representation. And first and foremost, I suppose, we could look at the system of government. Um, in the UK, we have a, a two-house system of government um, and those who are elected to be um, members of parliament are supposed to represent the entire country. And uh, just as 
we would expect that representation to come from all different parts of the country rather than just to be centric to one area politics is often accused of being incredibly london centric which is a fair criticism you would hope that there would be representation across all different parts of the country equally we would expect a representation that matched up to uh, the diversity of the country and of course the fact that uh, 50% of the country are women. So before we get onto the actual facts and figures of uh, of that, we can have a look at how uh, Parliament works and see, probably make a guess as to where this is going. Too busy bickering on TV to run the country? There's got to be more to the House of Commons than that, right? Before the House of Commons or the House of Lords, there was just the King and his barons. The King could call on them whenever he wanted, but he didn't count on them becoming powerful. And in 1215, they made King John seal Magna Carta, which forced him to obey the law and set up an advisory council of 25 men. 50 years later, Simon de Montfort rebelled against Henry III and for the first time invited representatives of the towns together with the Knights of the Shires to his 1265 parliament. These citizens met separately from the nobility and evolved to form the House of Commons in 1332. So, now there are two houses, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. As the rights of the people increased, the King and nobility became less powerful, and the balance of power eventually swung to the Commons. In 1512, a huge fire consumed Westminster Palace. Henry VIII moved out, and once rebuilt, it became Parliament's home. Parliament still works from Westminster today and has three parts, the House of Commons, the House of Lords and the monarchy. Members of the House of Commons are elected by you and me. Every five years, we elect representatives to run the country on our behalf, which means we run the country. Kinda. It's easy to run as a candidate. You just have to be 18, not in prison, and not a lord. Oh, and also, you can't be the monarch. Ever since Charles I burst in on the chamber uninvited, no king or queen has been allowed in. So, what does the house actually do all day? It debates important issues makes and reviews our laws, represents the public, and holds the government to account. Inside the House of Commons there are two sides. On one side the government who run the country, and on the other side the opposition who keep an eye on what the government are doing. The chamber only has 437 seats for over 600 members, so MPs have to pack in for big debates. The Commons Speaker sits at the head of the room to maintain order. The Prime Minister leads the government and appoints ministers to form a cabinet. You'll see them on the front bench. It's the government that introduces most of the ideas for new laws and changes to old ones. The opposition questions and challenges the government. All MPs split their time between the House of Commons and their constituency. Often MPs have to figure out what's best for their party or what's best for the local people they represent, even the ones who didn't vote for them. There are lots of ways the government is held to account. Every week, for half an hour, the Prime Minister comes to the House of Commons to answer questions from MPs. It's dramatic, it's heated, and it's this that gets the most viewers tuning in. But it's not just the PM in the hot seat. MPs get to question ministers from all government departments. And then, there are select committees where MPs spend a lot of time reviewing the policies and spending of government. This is called scrutiny. They speak to experts and the public to understand how laws affect our everyday lives. This work helps the government shape their policies. Also, whenever the government wants to raise taxes, the House of Commons has to agree. They review any proposed bill before they vote. So it's not just a lot of rowdy bickering. They do more than what's shown on TV. Debating important issues, making laws, holding the government to account, and allowing MPs to represent the public. That's you. So, what do you think of the House of Commons now? Okay, so quite a handy little video there. Also a little recap on uh, what government is for those who are maybe a little bit cloudy on that. Um, and also a lovely little potted history of how it all came to be. So we have an incredibly old parliament in our uh, country. We've had uh, representation um, in the form of two houses for over 800 years. Um, you may have noticed from the first few uh, in animations that there are very few women in them. And... Uh, that's quite clearly done on purpose because, of course, despite a very, very democratic system in terms of making sure the people have had their say and been able to represent the public at large, um, women weren't actually allowed to become MPs for 
quite a long time. Um, uh, in eight, uh, 800 years, we've only had female MPs for the past 100. So, as I said before, the idea of a patriarchy not just being about numbers, but also about a system, a structural um, system which uh, would take a long time to uh, change and evolve um, and of course the parliament is incredibly important um, laws are made decisions are made people are represented and if you are not if you don't have 50 percent of your population representing the public then of course laws aren't made necessarily with both sexes in mind Let's have a look at the current representation in Parliament. Again, you would kind of hope this was 50-50, seeing as the, the makeup of the country is 50-50. We currently, as of the last election in the end of 2019, have 220 uh, MPs. The good news is this is the greatest uh, amount of female MPs there has ever been in the House of Commons. Um, which uh, is obviously um, a step in the right direction. But as you can see, there are still 429 male MPs, which means that there are more than 66% or two-thirds of, um, of our parliament are made up, uh, or is the ratio of uh, men to women, um, which um, obviously doesn't necessarily represent the country as a whole. Um, and when it comes to taking advice, making decisions, forming laws, as I said, representation is so important. Um, this is a step in the right direction. As you can see, um, if we look at how things have improved massively since even 1979, which was only 41 years ago, where there were less than 5% of uh, MPs were female and now we've uh, made it up to uh, 33 or 34%. So a huge amount of changes have happened but it, can sh it also illustrates that sharp rise in just how deep-seated the structural problems are in Parliament and just how deep-rooted and systemic a patriarchy is in our own government, in our own uh, politics as it were. And as I said, the first female MP didn't arrive till 1918, and that's the same time, of course, as women as a sex were allowed to vote and have any influence on um, on, on the parliament as well. And as I'm sure you know, the uh, entire system has only had two female prime ministers uh, in its entire history out of about 55. So moving away from politics, because of course, it's an easy example, and it's one I'm sure you were expecting uh, to see. What other aspects of society have a huge influence? Well, outside of politics, I guess we would say the business is the next uh, big um, aspect or big part of society that uh, we could look at. Um, so if we consider business, I'm afraid that the uh, facts aren't necessarily much better. Um, women in business are rarely on the boards um, or the, in terms of decision making, are rarely in positions of particular power or influence. Um, it doesn't really happen. Um, if we look at even lower than just on the board of directors and consider wh how women fare in senior management, um, if we look at a list of countries where where that have the most women in senior management, uh, we actually find that the UK uh, falls uh, somewhere in the middle with only 21%. Okay, the proportion of senior management roles held by women, this is a statistic from 2016, was only 21%. So only one in five people um, in senior management positions in businesses and firms are actually women. So, okay, again, a real disparity in... in um, representation um, and of course what we know that this can lead to and those structural problems in businesses and systemic issues obviously leads to problems with uh, wage gaps as well something that's hotly debated and controversial and you'll never find figures that's, that are representing um, a, a complete accuracy because there are so many different ways of measuring this but what can be seen is that there is a difference between average gross hourly earnings of men and women um, and again the UK does not necessarily fare too well in this um, 
um, the fact that there's a gap at all suggests that there are systemic problems. Uh, the other argument would be, oh, uh, a meritocracy. You know, why, uh, you know, surely it's important that um, the best person for the job works on the board of directors or the best person for the job is in senior management. And that, you know, is an utterly valid argument. The issue is similar to uh, politics and government is that when these issues are completely systemic, when they are a structural problem that go back historically, then women are much less likely to succeed or make their way up. If you've got um, eight out of ten people on the board of directors or in senior management that are all men, and you're employing someone else to fill that position, are you more likely to find someone who you have something in common with, that you can see yourself in, and of course the cycle repeats itself. Okay, one last example before we move back to the media. Um, apart from business and apart from politics, I suppose we could look at another aspect, for example, uh, the judiciary, the law courts, okay? Um, and not going to be any surprises here, but we still see that there is um, a massive significant difference in those uh, judges, the people who are making big decisions in terms of courts and laws, and uh, not just whether people go to prison or not, but how the law is used and activated as well. As you can see from the top there, 29% of court judges and 46% of tribunal judges were female. Okay, um, um, a huge underrepresentation of court judges, not so much with the tribunal judges, but of course still um, uh, less so. And again, this will be a structural problem. Uh, the first ever um, um, county court judge and the first female high court judge in England was um, uh, Elizabeth Kathleen Lane, um, who became a judge in 1962. Okay, so just not a lot over well, just under 60 years ago. So these are systemic and structural problems and issues. Uh, one thing that is interesting that you might note at the bottom there is actually w women are dominating in uh, the magistrates' courts, which are the smallest courts of the land and the most sort of prevalent, I suppose. Um, so it's not that women don't have an appetite or a desire uh, to be in the judiciary and part of that court system and actually succeeding. Uh, interestingly, though, um, you may know if you study law, the magistrates is not a paid position. So actually more women are kind of giving up time to be part of this system, give to their community, uh, but even in unpaid circumstances. So hopefully that sort of just gives you a slight idea of some of the systemic and structural issues as well as the uh, idea that when we talk about representation, of course, we in media studies referring to the media specifically, but if it is uh, can be a lot more than that. And hopefully it gives you a bit more of an understanding of what, for the purposes of our arguments we're discussing regarding the patriarchy. So let's go back to look at sexism within the media. Um, you know, we can look at all different media products here. We can look at TV or video games, advertising or newspapers. But the clear that the roles that women fulfill and how the audience is encouraged to look at women reinforces numerous sexy, sexist ideologies. Okay, um, In terms of uh, relying on what women look like or whether they're, what their roles are within a domestic sphere, women are defined in very narrow, limited ways. Um, we have looked at the objectification of women and sexualization in mainstream media, a lot about advertising, but even the nation's most read newspaper still carried uh, images of uh, naked women on its third page up until just a few years ago. Um, reference on this slide to uh, that wage gap that we mentioned before, but within a media context, um, the BBC came under high scrutiny a couple of years ago that its uh, male presenters would be paying paid far in excess than any of its female presenters. Um, and my particular favourite example is this newspaper one here. The Mail Online almost feels like it's trolling um, when it reports on the story of uh, the actress Gemma Arterton in rather condescending terms decide, describing her as an English rose, defining her entirely by, by what she's wearing um, and by her appearance um, when the story is actually how she's 
gone on TV to talk about women's rights. Like I said, I'm sure there was kind of a uh, tongue firmly in cheek there, but it, it's a great example of how women are often reduced to quite simple signifiers in the media. So, handing things over to you, we can consider the way that women are represented in three different codes, really. Representational codes, they're used to portray men and women in the media. Okay, so those kind of... Um, key signifiers uh, to represent women. We can also look at the division of gender roles in the media and what we're, what women are expected to be uh, to, to, to do, what they're expected to be, what they're defined by. And of course, the third one that we've talked about with other theorists, the objectification of women in the media. So what I'd like you to do is pick any type of media from the following list. Advertising, magazines, newspapers, music video, TV or film, but specifically film marketing, and explore the different representations in texts that you know are guilty of representing women in a way that could be seen as sexist. Consider all three elements on the left hand side, the representational codes, the division of gender roles, and that could be the use of stereotypes as well, and of course their objectification, which we've looked at. So do some research, think of some texts and uh, give an analysis of one media type, uh, citing uh, at least two different examples. There's a big however that accompanies this, though. Of course, we are living in the 21st century, and as we've seen from um, issues relating to politics and business as well, uh, things change and of course it would be ridiculous of us to suggest that this is a, a wide blanket um, sexism across the media not all media reinforce patriarchal values and it's also really important not to confuse texts that represent female oppression with texts that are ideologically sexist in their values many media products can actually talk about sexism represent sexism and um, actually represent a um, an oppression of women but of course they're not necessarily reinforcing it they may be discussing it they may actually be addressing the issue of female oppression so think of the media that you considered for that first activity um, can you think of texts which might represent sexism towards women but actually are doing it to challenge patriarchal values and ideologies they are critiquing um the patri patriarchal values um they're representing uh, sexism or, or female oppression in order to uh, challenge it in order to show that it's wrong okay moving on to Underrepresentation, which is another huge problem uh, that uh, we can talk about uh, when discussing hooks, and of course it's something that we have discussed uh, previously uh, as as well uh, regarding other representations. Um, there's a brilliant measure for underrepresentation of women in film, known as the Bechdel test. Um, I'll show you a quick video, and then we can explore this in a little bit more detail. In the 1980s, cartoonist Alison Bechtel observed a frustrating trend in pop culture. Most films only had a single female character. And when there were multiple women in a film, their storylines almost always revolved around men. Just call him. Say hello. He's in my book club. Why is there a woman in this picture? It's his wife. This realization inspired her to create a comic called The Rule. I only go to a movie if it satisfies three basic requirements. One, it has to have at least two women in it who two talk to each other, about three something besides a man. These requirements form the foundation of the Bechdel test, which has become a tool used to call attention to gender inequality in pop culture. For example, this scene fails the Bechdel test. Who's Alan's friend? Hugh. He's a bit of a cad, actually. So my type, then. While this scene passes it. And you have no style or sense of fashion. Well, um... I think that depends on what you're... No, no. That wasn't a question. 
Bechtel credits the idea for the test to her friend Liz Wallace, who was inspired by Virginia Woolf's essay, A Room of One's Own. Woolf writes, all these relationships between women are too simple, and I tried to remember any case in the course of my reading where two women are represented as friends. They are now and then mothers and daughters, but almost without exception, they are shown in their relation to men. Whatever we do, we always want to look our very best. I mean, why imagine if our husband saw us in worn, dark, urban sweat clothes with stringy hair and almost no makeup. Even though Wolf's essay is over 90 years old, limited female representation in pop culture persists today. A survey of 120 films by the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media revealed that only 31% of the named characters were female, and 23% of the films had a female protagonist or co-protagonist. Okay, I'm a lady, she's a lady, you're a lady, we're the ladies. The website BechtelTest.com is a user-generated list of over 6,500 films that catalogs which films pass the test, with the added requirement that the female characters must be named. And while the requirements to pass might seem simple, there are an enormous amount of very successful films that fail. We're ranking girls. You mean other students? Yeah. As the Bechtel test gained popularity, it also became the subject of intense scrutiny, because some people assumed that films that fail the test were automatically considered bad. Bechtel never intended for the test to be a way to comment on the quality of a film, and she admits that her favorite film doesn't pass the test. I don't really follow this scheme in my real life. What's no, your favorite I'm movie? <laughs> Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day does not pass the back Majorly, test. majorly fails. <laughs> majorly yeah. fails the Groundhog Day. <laughs> Another important distinction to make is that the Bechtel test is not a way to evaluate whether a film is feminist. For example, the film Gravity fails the Bechtel test, while Sir Mix-a-Lot's Baby Got Back music video does pass the test. Oh my God, Becky, look at her butt. Andy Zeisler, co-founder of Bitch Media, wrote of the test, Bechtel and Wallace expressed it as simply a way to point out the rote, unthinkingly normative plot lines of mainstream film. It was never meant to be a measure of feminism, but rather a cultural barometer. What Zeisler means is that the Bechtel test is most effective when applied on a universal level. When hundreds of successful films struggle to pass the requirements, it's important to reflect on how this impacts the way audiences are conditioned to think about women. Says NPR's Netta Ulabi about the test. It articulates something often missing in popular culture. Not the number of women we see on screen, but the depth of their stories and the range of their concerns. You're good at hiding stuff, huh? My mom calls it compartmentalizing. Apparently I do that a lot. Bechtel's test has inspired others to create their own tests based on race, ethnicity, or sexual orientation. Other tests being developed through 538.com look at the diversity of the crews making up these projects. And hopefully by continuing to give creative power to women, audiences will be exposed to even more complex, compelling, and relatable stories of female friendship and accomplishments. Thank you for getting me into the league, Daddy. <laughs> you got yourself in the league. I got you on the train. In 2017, the top three grossing films all passed the Bechtel test with flying colors. So even though gender inequality is still prevalent, progress is being made. And the characters from Bechtel's original comic would have more options at the box office today than they did in 1985. Okay, so um, as the narrator of the video said that the Bechdel test itself um, really um, isn't just to uh, um, to scrutinise movies um, for their quality or their content. It works best when you gather a lot of films together to find out, uh, as, a, as they say, in a cultural barometer, how underrepresented women are. Some fantastic movies, some very, very positive representations of women with real depth fail the test sometimes and other times movie you know there can be texts that pass the test which may be inherently sexist or um in in their representations of women so it's it's by itself there will always be 
examples that undermine it or prove it wrong as it were but it is more of a barometer for anything um, which is really interesting um, for looking at films uh, en masse but of course the theory was developed for film but is applicable to other forms of media um, so what forms of media would you say have a kind of male dominance uh, in terms of numerical representation and to follow that question up would you say there are any reasons for this uh, that isn't the fault of the media? Or do they always have a choice? Are there media types that are also dominated by women? So two questions there, really. Are there some aspects uh, whereby a media type is dominated by men that uh, isn't the fault of the media? Or do you believe that there is industry always has a choice and secondly um do you f do you know of any or do you feel there are any media types that you would say are dominated by women okay so moving on to the theory itself um, and as always uh, there's a simplified reduction of hooks's ideas that will help us remember the sort of thing she's talking about uh, so first of all, the idea that feminism is a struggle to end a sexist or patriarchal oppression and the ideology of domination. Okay, That's what we've been talking about so far. Domination in the form of numerical data, but also domination in the form of reduction of roles, simplification of women, stereotyping and so on. Um, and because um, feminism is uh, that a struggle, as uh, we refer to, that this is a, uh, uh, Bell Hook saw this as a kind of a political commitment, not just a lifestyle choice that you can kind of move in and out of. And interestingly, and as we move through this presentation, you'll see that we can see that um, this struggle extends to race and class and other underrepresented or minority groups, not just uh, sex or gender. Um, the extent to which individuals are exploited, discriminated against or are oppressed is all part of what Bell Hooks is discussing. Um, if you were wondering uh, at all, this often comes up, uh, why Bell Hooks uses only lowercase letters for her uh, first and second name. Uh, this was done on purpose to suggest that her work is more important than she is as an individual. Um, she wanted to be known more from her work than a name, so she decapitalizes to kind of reduce the impact of that. Anyway, more important stuff. Her basic premise, of course, is that the media has both the power to reinforce, but also vitally has the power to challenge notions of oppression and inequality. And of course, that she sees this struggle not only about gender or sex, but it's about all oppression, whether it's race, ethnicity, sexuality. Um, she sees that uh, oppression in lots of media, or she sees that the media has the power to uh, to crush that uh, oppression, to, to fight against it. So the nice thing about Bell Hooks's theory is that we can apply it to all media types. It's not she doesn't say one singular thing about the media that it is either this or it is either that or it must always look at this way. We can actually look at different media texts and make an assumption about what she might say about it. So to kind of practice this or to uh, to get your own measurement of this, I'm going to put two statements uh, up, and I want you to think about which one you agree most with first statement in the fight for equality modern media is a force for good and the second statement the white middle class male still dominates most media in both representation and in industry so i want you to decide which statement would you agree with most and of course very importantly what would be your evidence for that? So the, as I mentioned, the good news about this is that uh, we can apply hooks to all media products, really. And just by assuming what she might have to say about it. Uh, so these are just four different ways that you might want to consider 
uh, how to apply Bell Hooks's work, um, we could look at whether or not it reinforces her points by representing women in a sexist way. We could say that maybe it reinforces ideas by discussing sexism and patriarchal values. Or we could say that it challenges her ideas through a positive representation that promote feminist values, equality, independence. Or we could say that maybe her ideas are challenged by denying that there is any need for feminism and that there is no patriarchy at all. So these are the different ways that, loosely speaking, you could apply her theory. And of course, uh, you may have done so in your uh, decision as to whether statement one or statement two is the most true so make a decision based on what you argued um, in the previous question um, and the evidence you gave what would bell hooks say about the media that you used as an example let's have a look at some examples of our own now I'm going to give you a collection of different media products and I want you to look at them and consider what Bell Hooks would have to say about them. And remember that for Hooks, oppression is about inequality in whatever form it may take. If a group is being oppressed from above, then this can be something the media can attempt to rectify or, of course, it can make it worse. So the first one we're looking at here are three texts regarding uh, people on benefits. So what would Bell Hooks say about each of these media products? Of course, the odd one out here is I, Daniel Blake. Um, the two uh, national dailies um, are quite scathing or uh, sarcastic in their representation of those who access benefits. Um, they are stereotyping them in a negative way as being sponges or scroungers or lazy. And of course, we know from our study of I, Daniel Blake, of course, this is a film which is very sympathetic um, to that cause. So I guess if we're looking at how to apply hooks for the, in the case of the Express and the Mail, um, we, would, we would say it's probably uh, A. Um, it reinforces the points she makes about representing uh, those who are marginalised, those who, um, who are... Uh, perhaps misrepresented in society um, and in the case of um, I, Daniel Blake, we could perhaps use a C, that perhaps it challenges some of our ideas through being a positive representation that promotes values that are fighting oppression, that are fighting negative stereotypes. Another good example is often using looking at uh, refugees who are often given a rough time by the mainstream media. Um, again, we could look at the daily national daily newspapers here, the Express and the Mail, um, the Sun, and of course uh, Katie Hopkins' uh, quite mean spirited and nasty column in the uh, when she had it in the Daily Mail. Uh, some of the references and the language used to uh, describe and represent refugees and asylum seekers um, was quite scathing and negative. Uh, and again, though, uh, this would suggest that Hooks um, is kind of right, that there is this kind of discrepancy, that there is this patriarchal system that is uh, negatively representing minority groups and the um, the oppressed in society um, for balance I found a text which um, is uh, perhaps more positive that is part of the solution for hooks that is part of a media product which is actively uh, fighting that uh, oppression um, in this case it's an advert for the UNHCR which is the United Nations High Council for Refugees uh, in a really quite striking advert okay so we're getting towards the end now and I just wanted to provide a, a small example from uh, something that happened last year and this particular example revolves around um, ethnicity and race uh, rather than uh, gender and sex um, of course, despite living in an increasingly progressive society, you know, discrimination um, will often rear its ugly head. And uh, unfortunately, the media is rarely far behind when it comes to this. Um, 
So this is an instance um, of racism when footballer Raheem Sterling called out racism that he uh, felt that he was suffering in the football stands that he was playing in. But also he was quite candid and open about saying that he felt that this was being um, reinforced by certain media outlets, that it wasn't just something that was happening at football grounds. It was actually being perpetuated by the media. And he pointed out, you know, in his own analysis of the media, something we don't necessarily associate with footballers, but in his own analysis of the media, he seemed to notice that uh, um, young black players were being treated quite differently to young white players. He pointed out that uh, often uh, young black players were criticised for their overt uh, wealth and their um, uh, their, their um, f- sort of fame and fortune, um, and that when young white players were represented, it was always in a much more positive ways. I've just provided one example there of uh, of. Um, a newspaper, uh, online newspaper, uh, representing um, a young black footballer, um, uh, 25 grand a week, splashing out on a mansion on market for 2.25 million, despite having never started a Premier League match, uh, whereby the story about Phil Foden, this is kind of a nice, cute story about he's bought a 2 million home for his mum. Essentially, it's the same story. Young man with lots and lots of money, buys a two million pound home but in one of them it's kind of quite scathing it's almost uh, as if that this person is being reckless and wasteful with their money and of course the when it's the white player it's framed as this uh kind of uh, loyal respectful thing to do uh, for his uh, mother and of course the full truth of those stories is is not really revealed at all so um sterling was um was came under fire for this and not necessarily directly criticised by everyone, although he was criticised by some for bringing these issues up. But he was frequently asked to justify this position. Um, One of these invitations uh, or occasions was an invitation from Piers Morgan um, to defend the comments that he'd made um, on Good Morning Britain. Um, Rather wisely, Raheem Sterling declined to appear on this um, and as Gary Lineker pointed out, if he feels like he's the one being attacked, why does he need to go on and justify uh, his position? Um, interestingly, though, in the wake of this, one person that was asked about this quite often was the um, uh, prominent black footballer John Barnes, who rose to fame in the 1980s. He became one of the um, England's uh, best wingers of that era, uh, but is someone who as uh, an early prominent black footballer for England, often suffered racism himself whilst playing the game. Uh, But what the interviews with him revealed is not just uh, his own experiences of racism within football, but he actually explores the systemic and the structural causes of racism in both society and the media. While, While campaigns like Kick It Out have done much to rid football of racism, the subject has sadly reared its ugly head once again over this weekend. Manchester City and England star Raheem Sterling was allegedly racially abused during his team's clash with Chelsea. That's prompted a police investigation. Yesterday, uh, the player himself had his say on social media. Yeah, in a message on Instagram, he said, as you can see by my reaction, I just had to laugh because I don't expect no better. And he went on to claim that some newspaper articles about players help fuel racism and aggressive behaviour. He referred to a headline about his Manchester City teammate at Osin Adaraba Ayo uh, buying a house, which he said painted the player in a bad light. He pointed to a similar story about a white teammate, Phil Foden, which he says was worded more positively. I'm well, delighted to say uh, we're joined now by England and Liverpool legend John Barnes, who's faced racist abuse during his career. Uh, John, I feel we could debate this for, for hours with you, but let's start with the Raheem Sterling incident and, and his... Uh, subsequent posts on social media. Do you think that the media plays a role in stoking racial hatred in this country? Absolutely. Absolutely. Not just in football. And I think Raheem should have wined it to not just talk about the perception that we have over over footballers, just as that article um, portrays, but also, generally speaking, when we hear about um, Muslim terrorists and and, and Nigerian uh, conmen and Yadi drug gangs uh, and and, and Muslim grooming and paedophile gangs, whereby there are many more white paedophiles, white drug dealers, um, 
than than there are of of the other group of people. But but we don't hear we we don't, we don't talk about that. Now, what that does, it is not targeting, or or it's not painting a negative image of of drug dealers or a negative image of 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 pedophiles. It's, it's portraying a negative image of Muslims or of Nigerians or of Yadis. And it is a very subliminal, subtle way of indoctrination, because. I have an argument with, 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 and I've had it for many, many years, as to whether the media influences society or it's a reflection on society. And in, more often than not, it influences society. Something which you may think is completely un unrelated is Brexit, because we have been influenced, not just the people who voted leave, but the people who voted remain, based on the rhetoric that we heard, which, which influenced us one way or the other. So we are definitely influenced by what we actually see. So when Raheem talks about, which is very, very good, because and we can't just label it to football, mm. because racism is a problem in society, and we can't compartmentalize it and say it's in the police or it's in football, because it absolves the rest of society, in terms of looking at itself, to then say, how culpable are we in being mm. part of this? And we all are. Do you think, then, it's something that's getting worse? It's not getting worse, but because we didn't hear it, we thought it was getting better. Right. Now, in football, what football can do is they can say, if there are any racist chants, we're going to kick you out to the ground. So for any unconsciously racist football fans, all you have to do is keep your mouth shut. That doesn't mean it's getting any better. Mm. But of course, in times of confrontation, as you saw with Raheem, people show their true colours. And people say, so you can't tell me those three people who actually were racially abusing him, they would have been hundreds who probably would have felt like saying the same thing, but they didn't. Mm. So does that then mean it doesn't exist? So until we start to, challenge, to tackle it holistically, looking at how to get rid of racism, and the only way we can do that, the only way we can do that is to tackle the cause, not the symptom. And that incident is the symptom of it, as is we've seen symptoms from, from Luis Suarez, John Terry, we've seen so many symptoms. And very much like a disease, you have to tackle the cause of racism, not the symptoms. And all we're doing is tackling the symptoms. So going back to the time where bananas were thrown on the pitch when you were playing football, do you think that even though football maybe has tidied up its image a little bit, society still has those same sort of issues to wrestle with? Well, be before we are members of any football fraternity, we're members of society, so we're doing it the wrong way around. You can't look at football because for football, for 90 minutes on a Saturday, or obviously football is played at different times now, you can't just say because for the 90 minutes we don't see it anymore means it doesn't exist in society. It is prevalent in society as you're going to the inner cities and see how disenfranchised and how lack of opportunities are there for members of ethnic minorities. So why should football be any different? We, we've heard, uh, because of what happened to Raheem, Robbie Earl and Jason Roberts both saying that they feel like they've failed Raheem Sterling. What, what are your thoughts on that? First of all, they haven't failed Raheem Sterling because there's nothing they can do to change, to change it. Society has to change. They can't change society. Society has to change. And the only way we can do that is, and I always say this, for every Raheem Sterling, John Barnes, who may talk about how we were racially abused, for every Stormzy who says that um, singers won't get um, Grammys, and for every Idris Elba or black actors who say we're not getting Oscars, what about the average black person in the street? And until we change the perception of the average black person in the street, there will always be the opportunities for the so-called superstar black celebrities to get an Oscar and to get a manager's job and to, and, and to get a... But that won't change. The only way we can change racism is if we change the perception of the average black person in the street and then you'll have many more average black people being given what they deserve. So in terms of those, those newspaper headlines and those stories that Raheem Sterling was, was specifically talking about, you talk about changing society. What can the, the newspaper industry, and the, not just the newspaper industry, but the media in general, what sort of things would you like to see in, the, in terms of the changing of those, narr of those narratives? And is that a long-term process, or can that change It's through? a very long-term process. We're talking about hundreds of years of indoctrination in, in, in showing that there are certain groups of people who are more worthy than others. I'll give you an example. I don't really want to talk about this particular person uh, in, in, in a bad light, or a, it's obviously not a, a different channel, but this is just the, the, the principle. Um, Piers Morgan. And I don't know Pierce, and I'm sure he's a very, very nice man, but the character of Pierce can only be for a white middle-class man who will be successful on television. If it was a woman with Pierce's character, that would not be acceptable. Or if it was a black man, it would not be acceptable. Because people may say he's belligerent, people may say that, that he's condescending, but he's accepted because he's a white middle-class. Now, it's going to take a long time to change perceptions of different groups of people, but we know the group, of the, the, we know the groups of, or the group who is completely accepted no matter what, happens, we know who that is, and is, uh, the discrimination affects women, it affects ethnic minorities because it's a perception of that person's capabilities. Now for a woman to lead, for a, a black person to think, for a homosexual to, to fight in a war, these perceptions are misconceptions we've had over hundreds of years and we can't change it by just all of a sudden coming together and saying, 
you know what you've learned and what has been instilled in you for hundreds of years? That's wrong because we're all equal. It's not as simple as that. Can I ask you a question, which, and I accept this from a, a white man asking a black man this question. When you get asked questions about something completely different, does, does that thought which you've articulated so well, does that underlie everything you think because you feel that there is a, a sort of a system which is sort of almost fighting against you in, but in some But in many respects, I'm not talking about me personally. Because no, but I, I, I yeah, No, 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 yeah. but this is the point I'm making. I'm th because John Barnes is fine, and so is Beyonce, and so is Obama, and so is black people in, in the higher echelons of society. Mm. But I'm talking about, and, and I understand what black people go through. So when people talk about, oh, isn't that terrible what happened to Raheem Sterling? I cannot believe that this is happening this day and age. You speak to black people in the cities and they say, this is what we go through every day. Mm. It's not a surprise to us. Mm. So when people are talking about, we thought this already got away because it doesn't affect you. So very much when, even from a black perspective, we're talking about discrimination. We're talking about it from a black perspective. But women go through discrimination. They're talking about it from a female perspective. LGBT, homosexuals, it's all discrimination based on the wrong, the misconception we have of those particular groups. And what I'm talking about is looking at it holistically rather than just saying, oh, it's a problem in football, it's a problem in, in, for, for women in business, it's a problem for homosexuals in the army. It is a problem of changing perceptions, and those perceptions are fueled by the media, as Raheem says. But don't just limit it to the way that the perception we have over, over young black footballers, the perception we have over, over different groups generally. Fascinating to talk to you this morning. I, I, you know, you said when you came on, we, how long have you got? I wish we had an hour because it's really interesting yeah. to talk to you, John. Thank you so thank much you. for coming on and sharing your Pleasure. views with us this morning. Yeah, thanks. For so there, John Barn really um, hitting the nail on the head when it comes to what we've been talking about so far and uh, thoughts of bell hooks as well, that this is a struggle against all oppression, against all uh, discrimination. Um, you know, the, the, these are certain areas that we look at, whether it's um, aspects of society uh, that we've talked about before, um, that... Um, that John Barnes squarely puts down to uh, being reinforced by the media and the power the media has to uh, alter those perceptions. Again, this would be something that we could talk about regarding uh, Gerbner and uh, cultivation model uh, and audience effects models, um, but also we could talk about it regarding Stuart Hall and his notion of um, outsiders and stereotyping as well. Just finally, to bring the whole... Uh, uh, aspect of Bell Hooks' work back to looking at gender and particularly representations of women. Of course, if we're considering this is not just a representation on screen or in print problem, um, we're looking at it as an industry problem as well, a systemic and structural uh, problem. Then, of course, this leads to other ways in which women are treated as well as represented. And certainly one of the uglier elements of patriarchal system operating in the media has actually seen prominent and influential men accused of abusing their power uh, to exploit mainly women. This has resulted in the emergence of the me too campaign where women have spoken out about their experiences of sexual exploitation or inequality of power being abused so um to finish this off um i think what's probably a good idea is to go online and research the me too movement find out about some examples of why the movement has managed to pick up a groundswell of attention obviously um the harvey weinstein case is the most um obvious and the most evident of these um but of course uh, there are other figures uh within the various media industries um that have been highlighting and promoting this issue and re you know and um openly talking about their own experiences um of not just a, a sexism within the media but where the inequality uh, within the industry within the the structure of the industry has meant that women aren't only represented in a sexist way but have been uh, victims of exploitation in different ways um this um last video is a satire with quite a lot of recognizable faces um it's a sketch uh, so it's made for sort of comedic purposes but as we've talked about in the past satire is uh, really Set, the comedy in satire is secondary to the message um, but this is a, a sketch talking about the expectation 
uh, that are put upon women and the roles in which they can find themselves and how sort of narrow and limiting they can be within TV, film, advertising and so on. You must be... Amelia? Stacy. Felicity for the lady part. And Florence. Reading for the leading lady part. I'm Gemma. And what did you think of it, the part? Well, I loved it. It's just a great part. I think she's great. How do you see her? She was feisty. Feisty? She's bold. <laughs> she's the one calling the shots. She's... Mm. I think she's pretty... Thank God. Clever. She's, <laughs> she's pretty... Clever. That's not what you're going for. Well... No. I mean, we hadn't really... No. Clever's not really something we... Want or care about at all, actually. You do realise this is the leading lady part? Should we have a read? It's what I've always wanted. The chance to speak... All right, thank you. I'm not sure that's quite what we're after, really. Do it again, but just this time, try it a bit more... smiley. You want me to smile? Yeah. Just, you know, more leading lady. The scene gets quite tragic. So? I sort of thought she'd be crying. Crying? <laughs> she could cry. Mm. But not like ugly cry. More like... Sensual, sexy crying, like wet. In a shower. A shower of crying and smiling. <laughs> Think of the poster. It's what I've always wanted. The chance to. Sm and let's stop you there. Do it again. Only this time, could you try it with a bit more makeup? I'm sorry. She's our leading lady. She's got to be. Peachy, if you could just... It's all I ever... Maybe lose the jumper. Sorry? The jumper. And the shirt. The, the shirt, why? And the rest of it. Was that really necessary? It's the character. Well, she's a doctor. Yes, and it's very hot. In the hospital. In South London. Exactly. Right, it says here that it's November. The heating's broken. NHS cuts. And she's trying to operate, but all this stuff keeps getting in the way. Her clothes. Yes, her clothes. Could we just... I'd always wanted the child. Oh, no. That was fine. I mean, fine. But could you just be a bit thinner? Thinner? Yeah, we really saw her as... Thin. Like a twiglet. Like a twiglet. Yeah, you know, feminine. Vulnerable, delicate and thin. But with a great rack. What? Stick thin with boobs. And hips. Oh, but not big hips. No, not, you know, baby bearing. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Sorry, I don't really get it. I, what are you asking me to do? It's not rocket science, darling. We're just asking you to be thin and curvy, sexy and innocent. So which? <laughs> Both. You know, sexy virgin. Thin, sexy hooker virgin with boobs and hips, but not big ones. She's never had sex, but she's all about sex. She definitely wants it. Oh, she wants it. But not too much. Not too much, but a bit. Yeah, like a lot, but a bit. Just, you know, leading lady. It's okay, stop there. Is everything all right? Yeah, could you just be a bit more white? Hi, I'm Lena. It's really nice to meet no. you. No. Sorry? We're after leading ladies, not leading ladies' mum. <laughs> Yeah, I am a leading lady. No, you're not. I am a leading lady. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Nope. Mum. Have you seen my IMDb? Yeah, you're a mum. Yeah, I've played some mums. Mum. I played a kick-ass mum. Kick-ass mum, still a mum. But you're hot. Yeah, hot mum. Hot mum. I could get on board with that. I can hear you. Next! Next! Wow, what's wrong with that? Menopause. Mm. Oh. 
Thank God. Oh. <laughs> I'm gagging for a coffee. Three skinny cappuccinos. Do you want yours extra hot? Oh, I'm, I'm actually here to read. What? I'm here to audition for the leading lady. Don't get it. She seems to think she is here for the leading lady. Yeah, but she's... This is awkward. Look, it's not that kind of film, darling. Uh, and what kind of film is that? I know what's happened. You've been sent to the wrong room. They're auditioning for that other film. Um, what is it? Black Panther Returns. That's it. That's in the next suite. No, I'm not here to audition for Black Panther Returns. I'm here to audition for your film. <laughs> Are you really not going to let me read? Wait, if you're passing Starbucks on the way out. What are we going to do? Hmm. That first one's big on Instagram. Yeah, but she was me. I don't think we... No, I just don't think we found the one. No. Hey! Yep. Is that it? Is that everyone? I'm afraid so. Do you think? What? Actually, I'd quite like to read. I'm just starting out. Look at my face. Sorry. I think someone else just turned up. Let me check. <laughs> <What is that? laughs> oh, yeah. hello. Hi. I'm Tom, and uh, I'm here to read for the leading lady. I'm just going to stop you there. You've got the part. Great. Hi. Yeah, yeah, it was... Oh, it's always hard to tell, isn't it? But I think I did all right. Yeah, I'm... I think I'm in with the shot. Yeah, me too. Me too. Okay, so um, as I said, a satirical take on uh, what the industry tends to do. Not supposed to be a kind of um, a real life example, though I'm sure many of those things have happened in casting sessions before, but more a take on what we end up seeing on screen um, due to kind of behind the scenes industry practices and decisions and, and so on and so forth. Um, of course, interestingly, um, bell hooks would actually say of that short film that it's part of uh it, i suppose in some ways it uh it does what it can to challenge and to break down that uh, patriarchal system so anyway i hope that makes uh, bell hooks's stuff uh, uh a bit more accessible for you or at least uh gives you more depth in uh, understanding it um and that you can look at any representations of women but also black and ethnic minorities um, representation of sexuality and maybe cast your similar eye over that okay thanks very much <laughs>